Well, emerald ash borers and Asian longhorn beetles, of course, and the amount of time it takes to sail those things across the ocean is just the right amount of time for them to develop in those wooden crates, emerge, and colonize your plants. Now, what does this mean? We have these invasive pests from a foreign land. We have exotic pests, and we've got native plants. We can kind of sort this thing out in a concept we call the coevolutionary or evolutionary matrix. There are certain possibilities. We have exotic plants with exotic insect pests. This results in a phenomenon we call enemy release. We have the situation where we have native plants and exotic insects and exotic plants and native insects. And in these scenarios, I'm not gonna talk again about enemy release, I'm gonna talk about a concept called defense-free space and what that might mean for plants and for the pests that attack them. And finally, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time in this portion on the native plant, native insect situation, uh, other than to say that specialist insects may be favored. So let's first look at what happens when we have exotic plants and we import exotic insects. A famous example, both I think here, because I've seen this pest on Euonymus, is Euonymus scale, yeah? So we bring in the scale insect and it just batters that plant, yes? Back in the States, we bring in uh, azaleas from Asia and they come in with azalea lace bug. This is the number one pest in Maryland because everybody in Maryland has 12 azaleas and everyone is infested with lace bugs. We have boxwood, a wonderful plant, deer resistant, but we bring in with psyllids and boxwood leaf miner, and now we've got a major problem. Why is this scenario so egregious? Why when we bring in an exotic plant and in the exotic pest in an outbreaking situation, why does that occur? What do they leave behind? It's like flying US Airways, what gets left behind? <laughs> the baggage, the luggage, right, the baggage. So the natural enemies that control those populations back in the native range simply aren't here, and it's welcome to America, right? The land of opportunity, gypsy moth. How do we know it's enemy release? Well, with this particular creature, as I said, it was brought in. We introduced a fungus called Entomophaga myomyga. It was introduced twice. We found this in Korea. It infects the larva, turns it into a fungus garden, and we saw a reduction in the number of acres defoliated from something like 8 million down to about 80,000 in a very, very short period of time. So once we can reestablish this connection of recoupling the natural enemy with its host, we reestablish that ecosystem process that helps regulate the populations back in their native range. Let's then talk about the situation of exotic plant, I'm sorry, of native plant and exotic insect. This is one we face every day. You guys are facing it here, we face it in the States all the time. Does anybody know what this tree is? Very good. These are not hobbits, these are full size human beings. Okay, these are very large trees. American chestnut, and this was the range of American chestnut. Of course, we imported chestnut blight, and by 1940, three and a half billion trees had died. American elm. We imported a, a, a competent vector, smaller European elm bark beetle, we introduced the fungal disease, and 40 million trees and counting since 1930. So the pattern here is when we have a naive plant, a native tree, which has never seen a pest in an evolutionary sense, we import the pathogen, this works for pathogens as well as insects obviously, it just crushes the native plant because it has no resistance. We call this defense-free space. In other words, the plant has no defense against it. The pathogen or the insect enters defense-free space and it simply has its way with the plant. Got it? Well, a little study. Some of you may uh, have heard the story. We have a, a rather um, 
serious problem right now with this emerald ash borer. We have our North American ashes, things like Pennsylvanica Americana. We have the uh, Manchurica, the uh, Asian ash, and we have a hybrid. Um, if we have this situation of exotic pest, native and exotic plants, who lives and who dies? Who thinks the native ashes live? Oh, good. Who thinks the exotic ash lives? I just have a few hands. Who doesn't think? <laughs> OK. Again, same story. Native ashes, no coevolutionary history, boom. The exotic ash, which has been duking it out over there for 65 million years with this pest, knows how to defend itself, and it does. Yes? Let's look at the different scenario now. What happens if we have exotic plants with native insect pests? Hmm. A situation quite common here. This is uh, North American birch, a wonderful study done by Dan Herms and his colleagues at Ohio State. We had several native species, Niagara, Papyrifera, Papulifolia, and back in the day when I first started my work, I heard these stories, these tales of these magnificent birch trees, paper bark birch trees, from places like China and from Europe that were going to be highly resistant to our native bronze birch borer, another agrilus species. So my question again, when a native pest meets an exotic plant, who wins and who dies? How many think the native plant dies? OK. How many think the exotic plant dies? Ah, uh, you're catching on. So. After 20 years, all of our native species are still alive, or the great majority, not all, but every one of the exotic plants have been killed by our native pest. Follow? Doesn't matter, the pests don't care. What's the important point here? The important point is a coevolutionary history, right? Doesn't matter where they come from, it's the association they've had through time, which is going to dictate the outcome of these. We now see things like uh, we have a native pine tree, white pine, and we like to th use things like mugo pines or pinus sylvestris, your scotch pine. When we import those trees, our red pines do fine, our scotch pine outbreak levels of scale insects, same deal. We've now documented more than 15 cases of these associations where we have the coevolutionary mismatch of native and exotic. The rule I believe here is the plant that is naive is simply going to be crushed when it has this encounter with the exotic or the unknown pest. So. This scenario is, uh, is not necessarily good for our urban landscapes, I think. And I think it reinforces this notion that we need to look carefully at what we have in place and what we plan to plant, and then what the potential is for movement and colonization of these new pests into any particular realm. I want to shift now and talk a little bit uh, about some of the problems we have in this last scenario, the native-native situation. But much of what I'll have to say will also be relevant to these other associations of exotic and um, exotic pest and exotic plant. I want to talk a little bit now about what some of these costs are associated, in the first case, with these exotic invaders. Uh, a wonderful study collection was done a few years ago. We going to, I'm going to talk about three different guilds of pests. Now, does everybody know what a guild is? In a land of Millers and Coopers and Smiths, uh, I, I think you have the guild concept. These are things that operate in the same way. In other words, boring insect form one guild. Our sapsuckers, things like aphids, 
and scale insects are another guild. And finally, we have our leaf munchers, the leaf feeders, the things that munch leaves are another guild. So let's have a look at this and what it means. Emerald ash borer is now distributed in 25 states. It has killed more than 100 million ash trees to date in North America. This is what a typical street might look like in a span of about three years. That's how long it will take to extirpate those ash trees. Now, the way we can be get to get a handle on this and to help in our decision-making process, you're going to hear much more. You heard the wonderful talk by Kenton this morning. How can we help our urban foresters make sound decisions about how to manage their ash populations? This is what we're doing now. Well, first of all, we need to define what, the, what that population is. And again, the tool we're going to use for this is the iTrees tool. Okay? We conduct our samples. We're able to populate the databases, estimate our population size. In a little study we did, we looked at several cities in Maryland, Annapolis, Bowie, uh, Upper Marlboro, Greater Upper Marlboro, and the various size categories of trees allowed us to estimate the population size in the various uh, municipalities. We can then use this tool to look at the various benefits provided by that ash forest. To make sound management decisions, you need to understand the benefits of trees first before you begin to overlay your costs of intervention, in this case for emerald ash borer. The uh, number I want you to keep in mind here is the bottom line. We looked at energy, carbon sequestration, air quality, storm water, aesthetic value. $152,000 annually. Now, I need a volunteer. Gentleman in the yellow shirt, can you remember 152000 Thank you. Great. Next, we are going to estimate the cost of management. And to do this, we use a tool, an online tool, called the EAB Cost Calculator. This was developed by my former student, Cliff Sadoff, who's now at Purdue University. And under a variety of management scenarios where we either remove all the trees, replace all the trees, treat, replace trees less than 24 inches and protect the other ones, or a program called Urban Slam, where we have a progressive treatment of certain trees to save your most valuable and remove your least valuable trees, this is about the cost it's going to take in a five-year time horizon. So five years, $54,000. Annual, annual benefit, 152 times five, because that's an annual. And what do we have? You've got a, you've got a damn big cost benefit or benefit cost ratio, don't you? So the knee jerk to simply come in and cut down all your ash trees is incredibly foolish because if you do this, you have lost all the benefit of those trees and you must start over. The considered approach, and I think the most realistic, is to have this hybrid model where you do your inventory, assess your benefit, remove your least valuable trees, protect your most valuable trees until the wave passes. And the wave does pass. It's like a great tsunami that rolls over the forest. And once this plague is abated, you're left with a forest canopy that's intact and valuable. OK, so I, this, is the, this is the program that many cities are now adopting. The real problem comes not in a city like Annapolis. It comes in Baltimore where we have some probably 290 or 300,000 ash trees, and in the urban areas surrounding Baltimore, another 5 million. This is going to be incredibly expensive problem to fix. In some of the Midwestern cities where this has happened, it has simply bankrupted those cities to the point where there is no longer money to buy school buses and books for children because the money is going into removing dead and dying ash trees. So get your inventories done, understand what your 
what your, the value of your urban forest, and then you can plan logically when these, uh, when these nasty, egregious pests arrive. It's not just the economics here that are important, however. I want to make it clear there's a much bigger issue here. Ash is a unique tree. It's a temperate olive, basically. We have about 12 species in North America, but we have 8 billion of these trees in North America. There are more than 20 other organisms whose lives are intimately associated with fraxinus. So it's not just 12 species that spin down the toilet. It's another 40 that get taken with them. So this is a worthwhile project to try to save these other organisms on an ecosystem level. I'm recommending we look at this. Manchurian ash. Manchurian ash is going to be a highly suitable host for many of these species. Let's start to substitute Manchurian ash as an arc to preserve some of these other species that otherwise might go extinct. Heresy, 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 to use a non-native species. Oh my goodness gracious. There's much resistance to this notion, okay? But I worry about the caterpillars that will be lost. I worry about those other species as well. This is the other bad guy, Asian longhorn beetle. Okay, interesting history, New York first, Chicago, still roaring away up in New England and in Ohio. Again, bores through the wood, big holes, it's a very large beetle. The way we deal with it there, it is a quarantine pest. So when we find Asian longhorn beetle, it's an eradication destruction program. We try to delimit it, we try to annihilate it. And these programs have been successful. We've eradicated several populations. This is the before and after of that particular pest. The other way we tackle this is with insecticide treatments as part of the eradication programs. And we treat a lot of trees. At my study site in New York, there were 240,000 applications of insecticides made. We're gonna circle back on that one in just a few minutes and we'll see what that means. Well, you guys have had a taste of this one too, haven't you? First over here in uh, Bovie Tracy and later over here in Paddock Green, but I think you got the handle on it and a good thing. Hopefully you'll be able to keep it out, but it will resurface. It resurfaces all the time in our quarantine inspection stations. We see it almost on an annual basis. So this is just rolling the dice. This is a probability game in my opinion. Okay. Again, your program was to remove many trees and I think this worked. What does it all add up to? Well, for emerald ash borer alone, the dark blue bars, it is more than $1.6 billion a year that we spend trying to manage and eradicate this pest. More than $3 billion when we include all these borers, 71 species. Another import from Asia was the hemlock woolly adelgid attacking our native hemlock trees, the eastern. It kills them, it kills our forests. It has spread very rapidly, first slowly, but is now moving out and very soon will be in the Midwest in that population of, of um, hemlock trees. And again, this is a multi-million dollar pest every year. I've already mentioned uh, gypsy moth imported by my, my dear friend Etienne Leopold Trevelo, who thought he could construct a silkworm industry by breeding gypsy moths with silkworm and feeding them oak leaves. He was an artist, a scientist, a dangerous combination in my opinion. <laughs> but nonetheless, the thing escaped and this has been the result. It moved rapidly, continues to spread throughout our country. Defoliators, again, in the hundreds of millions of dollars are spent every year trying to manage these invasive uh, defoliating pests. Let's turn now to, again, some of the other features that affect both our natives but also these exotic pests. I've dealt with one and two. Let's talk about biodiversity for a second. The Eastern deciduous forest, the creation of urbanization in the eastern deciduous forest, the east coast where I live, is basically a subtraction experiment. 
The first and most devastating change is agriculture. That's where we lose biodiversity. Americans have this strange notion of these bucolic landscapes with farms. This is incredibly destructive to native biodiversity. It's necessary. This is worst. We build McMansions, we call them. Uh, we strip away the soil. We strip away the trees. The soil is sent to a plant where it's processed, and then you get back to, you're able to buy back your own dirt at Home Depot. It's a great country. <laughs> this can become that, and that's not bad. This is the refuge. This is the biodiversity refuge. It's residential landscapes, city parks, and things like this. These are ecological preserves. And that's the death knell. That's my campus. Once we build the hardscape, it's almost impossible to reverse and recreate ecosystem services and ecosystem processes as we see in our native forests. It's often coupled with the loss of species in places like San Francisco, Los Angeles, Staten Island, Aurora, Colorado. Aurora's lost almost 50% of its indigenous butterflies. We just completed a worldwide analysis of carabid beetles. Carabid beetles are highly important ground predators of many of our key pests in landscapes, many caterpillars and such. The way these graphs are set up is that if they're to the left of this line, the zero line, it means the response to urbanization is negative. If it goes this way, it means there's a positive response. And what we found is the species richness and the abundances of the individual taxa were dramatically reduced by this process of urbanization. And who were the big losers? It was some of our largest beetles, and not surprisingly, our forest-dwelling beetles were the ones that were impacted the most in a negative sense by urbanization. What does that mean? It means we no longer have these large ground beetles that roam up into trees and murder caterpillars, like your processionary moth. So again, urbanization will have very important consequences for the native communities. My studies with residential communities and urban found that at, uh, at the level of uh, individual landscapes, we might have 70,000 plants per square kilometer, numbering more than 100 species in a residential setting. When we get to the deep urban environment, we're only going to have perhaps 48 species per kilometer square, and it's going to represent only 30 species. So I call this the diversity dilemma. Now, what does this mean? We were interested in the relationship between plant diversity and the diversity of arthropod pests in urban landscapes. We looked at some 200 sites with very low diversity, three tree species, or higher diversity with an average of 34, and this is the relationship we found. There's a lot of wiggle in this, but no question there's a significant relationship. So this tells us that by adding more plant species to a landscape, we get more pests. Now that's gonna be a good selling point, right, to your client. Mrs. McGillicuddy, we want you to increase your biodiversity so you can have more pests. Good selling point, yes? Well, the question then can be, can diversity save us in the end? And this is the other piece of the puzzle we found. Does anybody know what this thing is, by the way? It's a green lacewing, very good. There's another way to look at diversity, and that's what we call vegetational texture. It's not just species richness, it's how those plants occupy a three-dimensional space. We found in landscapes that were simple, did not have vegetational texture. We compared the communities of insects on these landscapes with very complex landscapes, with ground covers, herbaceous plants, understory, overstory, shrubs. Our white rat in these experiments is the azalea lace bug. And what we found in the simple landscapes, we had a hundredfold increase of lace bugs, this outbreaking pest, than in the complex landscape. Why? Why do those pests outbreak in the simple landscape but not the complex landscape? 
We call these top-down effects. In other words, we looked at the abundance of predators, something called predator pressure, the survival of lace bugs, and alternate prey abundance. What we found in these complex landscapes, every, uh, every mean here marked in red means significantly different. Six or seven out of the important predators were more abundant in the complex landscape than in the simple. There was only one specialist on lace bugs that was more abundant, thank you, in the simple landscape, okay? What we do then is we bring those predators in, we put them in petri plates and we feed them prey. I get paid to do this. <laughs> we multiply the number of prey they eat by the abundance and create what we call the predator pressure index and we found almost four times as much, three to four times as much predator pressure in the complex landscape by virtue of the great diversity and the vor voraciousness of those predators in those landscapes. And again, predator pressure is inversely related to the abundance of lace bugs. In the diverse landscapes, the complex land landscapes, the open circles here, they simply do not survive because predator pressure is so much higher. Simple experiments, simple landscape, three azaleas in mulch. You add some flowers and you quadruple the number of natural enemies in that landscape. Flowering plants are one of the keys, flowering plants. So how diverse is our urban forest? Well, I was curious about this, so I, I collected some inventories from 13 cities. And remember back, the lesson of Dutch elm disease was what? <laughs> yeah, avoid a monoculture, right? It was to avoid the monoculture, very good. And we did, we got rid of elm, didn't we? So we made it a maple forest, and an ash forest, and an oak forest. How clever was that? And then we imported emerald ash borer and Asian longhorn beetle. So where do we stand right now? About 50% of those forests are host to those two species alone. How many folks in here are under the age of 30? Good. Excellent. Hey, you know, youngsters, you know, my generation, except for that wonderful talk that Frederick gave about Leon, we just can't get it right, so please fix this, would you? <laughs> would you guys fix this finally? I don't want to be doing this again in 30 years. Okay, let's talk very briefly about climate change, the warming of our world. Uh, we have a lot of p politicians who don't believe in it. This is Glacier National Park. This is hard to argue with. It's now going to be renamed No Glacier National Park. Glaciers are gone. And uh, as we heard before, the urban environment due to the heat island effect can be 10 degrees centigrade warmer than the areas around it. What does it mean? It means that insects that were once constrained by cold move further north. They also move up in altitude. They become active earlier in each year and insects with multiple generations simply complete more. I'm not going to talk about the mismatch between phenology and pollinators right now. This is why, in part, we're having this enormous outbreak of our native beetles attacking native pine trees because they are no longer killed by lethal cold temperatures. They simply move up the mountain now and kill millions of trees. This is a pest in Southern California. It's called cottony cushion scale, a pest of citrus. It now overwinters in Maryland. A major bark beetle pest from our southern states is now overwintering in New York. The vine weevil, you guys have problems with this, yeah? Well, guess what? Back in the states, it now emerges two weeks to almost a full month.